Hey, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Heather Veneziano. I'm the Associate Director of Tulane's Historic Preservation Program, and I also am a architectural historian and preservation consultant with the firm of Gambrill and Peak, based here in New Orleans. I'm going to walk you through a project that I worked on a couple of years ago with the Historic New Orleans Collection. It's an ongoing project, so um, new information is going to be added relatively soon, um, but I'll give you an overview of the site and some additional information so that way you could use it as a tool in your own research. Let me pull this up. Okay, so today we will be exploring the New Orleans Cemetery database. So this project has had um, quite a few partners and supporters throughout the years. The Historic New Orleans Collection, Save Our Cemeteries, Tulane School of Architecture's Historic Preservation Program where I work, Tulane Law School, um, the École Nationale des Chartes in Paris, um, the Historic Preservation Program at the University of Pennsylvania, my consulting company, the Archdiocese of New Orleans, New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, and Tulane University's Center for Public Service. So there's a lot of players, and that's just for the database itself. So a little bit about the history. Um, between 1981 and 83, Save Our Cemeteries, a local nonprofit, and the University of New Orleans, along with um, the Historic New Orleans Collection got together and they surveyed a number of cemeteries in town. The nine cemeteries were included in that original survey. Um, in 1984, that information was arranged and organized and made available at the Williams Research Center at the Historic New Orleans Collection. So in that original survey from 1981 to 83, the nine cemeteries that were included are St. Louis one and two, Lafayette one and two, St. Joseph 1 and 2, Oddfellows Rest, Cypress Grove, and the historic portion of Greenwood Cemetery. So as part of the survey, for all nine of those cemeteries, every single tomb um, had a black and white photograph taken of it, at least one photograph, sometimes more than one, but the majority only one. Data was inscribed from the tablets and the pediment. Um, that data included the names of the interred, any epitaphs, um, the years of date and birth, of, of death and birth. Uh, so the information gathered in this database ultimately is what was transcribed on the tablets. It's not the interment book. So anything inscribed on the tablet. So if your ancestor's name was not inscribed on the tablet and it was not available in the early 1980s, their name is not going to show up in the database. So if you know that they definitely were buried in, say, Lafayette number one or St. Louis one, but you cannot find them through the search function, it's because they don't have a tablet or their name was never recorded on that tablet. So the other information, um, information regarding the material of the closure tablet and its condition and an index. So in 2012, the Historic New Orleans Collection undertook a project to start digitizing the entire 1980s survey as a way to better make the information available to the public. So as part of that, students from Paris um, joined them in 2013 and 2014, and they developed a beta version of the database that would later evolve into the current one. In 2012, University of Pennsylvania's Historic Preservation Program um, did another survey of St. Louis Cemetery number two. And that's kind of branching off their earlier project between 2001 and 2003, when they undertook the project called Dead Space, which was focused in St. Louis One at the time. Many of you are familiar, um, Dead Space was a website that you were able to click on tombs and find more information about them. Unfortunately, it is no longer up and running through UPenn's website, 
Hopefully in the future, we'll get another organization to host that data, but currently it is unavailable to the public. So the 2012 um, survey done by University, University of Pennsylvania is also included in the current database as a way to kind of bridge that divide and then offer a perspective of what the cemetery looked like in 1981 and what it looks like in 2012. So I joined this whole project um, back in 2016. It started for me with a meeting in St. Louis Cemetery Number no. Two with Mary Lou Kristovich and John Stubbs, who was the current, who was at the time the director of Tulane's Preservation Program. So, in walking around the cemetery, we got to talking about the earlier survey that Mary Lou had worked on, um, and we we're saying to ourselves, "Why is this information digital? Like, let's try to get this off the ground and have it more accessible to the public." Little did we know, um, the Historic New Orleans Collection had already started really working on that, but it needed a, a final push to make it actually um, work properly. So through that initial conversation where I got involved, I wrote a seed grant proposal um, and I got a grant to fund the launch of the database. So working together with the Historic New Orleans Collection, my company, um, Tulane School of Architecture and Tulane Law School, we were able to launch the database design phase. So I acted as the external project manager, and I also created the data points present on the interactive aerial maps of both cemeteries, St. Louis 1 and 2. So over the next few years, survey from the survey index cards, data from the survey index cards were transcribed by students from Tulane University Center for Public Service and by staff and volunteers from Save Our Cemeteries. And this is an ongoing project. Um, just a few months ago, I was working with students, again, digitizing um, information from the survey cards for St. Joseph Cemetery number one. So we're slowly going through and transcribing everything and getting it all digitized and ready to be incorporated into the database. So for the transcription project for St. Joseph Cemetery number one, we had the digitized survey cards from the 1983 survey, which are right over here. And we give a whole PDF of those, a grouping of them to students. And they transcribe them into a database. So that way the information can be pulled and searchable on the website. So all of these names, this card is in German, which is kind of standard for St. Joseph number one. There's quite a few German um, language tablets in there. Um, so they transcribe this information into a digital database, and then that database works in conjunction with the website. So this information is not live on the website yet, but we're hoping to get St. Joseph Cemetery number one up next. So currently available for viewing online are the 1981 surveys of St. Louis Cemetery number one and St. Louis Cemetery number two and the additional condition reports from the St. Louis Cemetery number two produced by University of Pennsylvania in 2012. I just love this photo. This is one of the few photos of the field work happening in the 1980s. Um, I've done cemetery survey work. It is really, really hot. <laughs> um, so I just think it's, it's nice. Like I could imagine them moving their folding chairs after doing each tomb and just like making their way through the cemetery. Each cemetery has well over a thousand tombs. So it's it's quite a, a bit of work. We're so happy that they undertook this work at that time and getting all the information gathered for us to use today. So I'm gonna walk through how to use the actual database that's live now on the internet. But if you wanna follow along, you can scan this QR code or you can type in this web address to follow along. I'll leave this up for a second so you all can do that. Hey. <laughs> okay, so this is the New Orleans Cemetery database. 
It's hosted on the website of the Historic New Orleans Collection. I'm gonna show you, there's a couple of different ways to start your search. So I'll walk you through it. On the bottom of the page, I'm just gonna go back really quickly. On the bottom of the page, there's a few ways to search. There's advanced and simple search. There's locate tombs on Google Maps. Right now, we're gonna go over to the search tab, which is right here, the third tab. And when you get to that, you can search by the name of the memorialized person, which means the name inscribed on the tablet, or you could search by physical tomb in a number of ways. So if you wanna do an advanced memorialized search, you can choose all cemeteries, or you could choose one of the two cemeteries currently represented on the database. You can choose the last name, and this does not have to be exact spelling because we know there are many um, misspellings between different types of records. Um, you can search by maiden name, given name, year of birth, year of death, place of origin or military status. Um, we also have a historic cemetery abbreviation sheet, which I'll show you in a minute, but you can enter in any of these fields or all. I recommend starting with just one field and seeing how far you get because sometimes there's variables which will kind of stop your search. But so for advanced tomb search, again, you can search all cemeteries, St. Louis one or St. Louis two. You can search by street, which is the aisle in the cemetery. You can search by the tomb number based on the numbers used in that 1980s survey, so the Historic New Orleans Collection tomb numbers, or the Archdiocesan tomb numbers. So it's kind of frustrating because the numbers are not the same, but we gave on here, there's a link to a site where you can look and see which number is which. So it's a um, kind of a walkway between the numbers, and I'll show you that in a moment. It's really important when doing survey work um, to use the numbering system of the cemetery operator just so everything is consistent. So I just worked on a survey of St. Louis II again a couple years ago, two years ago now, and I used the Archdiocesan tomb numbers. I think it's really important just to have that consistency and be able to like access the records easily to be speaking the same language with the numbering system. Um, so you could also search name on pediment, inscription, the language. So it's interesting, like a lot of tablets, they'll start off in French or German. And then as time went on and their families became more integrated into American society, it switches to English. So sometimes there's more than one language. You can search by architect or stonemason, which is great, especially if you're researching a specific stonemason um, material, condition, and that's the condition of the tablet itself, not the overall tomb, symbols or decoration, um, which is also interesting way to search. So this is what I was speaking about earlier, the trying to figure out the differences and similarities between the numbering systems. So on the database, if it has ANO, that means alley numbers. And then it will say a number, it'll say left or right. And that means left or right of the center alley. This is for St. Louis one, each cemetery has this cheat sheet to help you understand what the numbering system is. So this these are the Archdiocesan numbers. To understand what those are in the database itself, um, if you scroll down, there is a reference sheet here. So alley number one, right of the center alley, tomb one is number one tomb um, in the database for St. Louis Cemetery number one. And it goes down, it walks you through all of it. So if you're confused about where exactly in the cemetery you're looking, this PDF available through the database is very helpful. So let's try to search. So I'm going to type in Landry, which is a very common name in our cemeteries, in the search tab under search by name of the memorialized person. So when I do that, 23 results matching my search come up. So those 
I did not specify St. Louis one or two. So that's including both cemeteries. So they have the name, date of death, view more on this person or view more on, on the tomb itself. And that's the same going down the list. So if I click on this one, I'm going to see their last, their surname was not Landry, but Landry is included because their place of origin is within St. Landry Parish. So it gives our last name, given name, death date, death year, death age, gender, place of origin, and then there's no additional information. So any information from the tablet is represented here. Some of these fields won't be populated if there is no information on the tablet, but I'm gonna go ahead and view the tomb of this individual. So when I click on that, I see that it's from St. Louis Cemetery number two, square three, tomb number Robertson 50A. It's a wall vault. And then it does not give me the Archdiocesan tomb number, but that's okay. So then I'm going to take a look at the survey card itself, because oftentimes it gives us additional information that is helpful. So in looking at this, because it's a wall vault, I have some other surrounding tablets as well. So it tells me St. Louis Cemetery number two, square three, Robertson wall vaults. This is card 28. Um, this survey was done on August 28th, 1981 which is also helpful because if your ancestor died in 1981, but they died in September, they're not going to be listed on this. So it's a good way to kind of know exactly what date is your start is your starting off point from working backwards. Um, for wall vaults, it gives the whole um, vertical row. So you have the first one, second, third, and our person that we are looking at is the last. So it has marble tablet with border and shelf, and then a little cross is inscribed on the tablet itself. The this is an exact um, transcription of the tablet. So sacred to the memory of my mother, Eliza Bouvet, born in the parish of St. Landry, died in New Orleans, February 25th, 1869, aged 48 years. And then one other name, Dora Caplion, 1888 to 1971. So that's a lot of information, um, more so than a lot of tablets, which is great because we're able to populate that into Ancestry or other sites and find more information about this individual. So then we can also look at the photograph that gives an image of the tablet on that day in August from 1981. So in doing that, we see exactly what was transcribed is correct, which is also important to look at because there is room for error. So we have the person out there in 1981 writing this down in their notebook, and then they give it to somebody back at the office and they type it up on the survey card. And then that survey card is digitized and then a student transcribes that and then it's put into the database. So. The written text goes through a lot of hands, so there is room for error. And sometimes you have spelling issues that come up. Sometimes numbers are a little bit off. So I think it's always best practice to look at the photograph itself because the photograph is not going to lie to you. Um, if you do see errors in looking at any of this, there's a way to contact the database through the website and update them on the information, then go in and make some corrections. But I always stress, like, please look at the photograph because it is literally what's written in stone. So also on this, because we know through the photograph and through the survey card, that there was one other person listed on that tablet. And that person is represented under memorialized. So if it's a tomb, it works in the same way. It'll have the person that we first landed on, but then it will list everyone else who was transcribed on the tablet of that tomb. For wall vaults, it's whoever also was in that one vault. So the other name, if we click on that on the side panel, 
it'll take us to her landing page. So it has her last name, her given name, birth date, birth year, death date, death year. So birth date is unknown. And so they just populate it with the year. The same with death date. They don't give the exact death date because that's not what was transcribed on the tablet itself. So we just have a lot less information about her, but we know in some capacity, whether it was through family or neighbors, we know that somehow she had a relationship with the other person in turn, or else they wouldn't be in the same vault. So to build out her life story, I think a good clue is kind of integrating it with the other persons. So in doing that, I got a little bit ahead of myself and I decided, oh, I'm going to try to find out as much as I can about Dora. Um, my first stop usually is find a grave because of all the crowdsourcing that goes on, people put other family members. So I was able to see, okay, her child was Lawrence Alfred Wheeler. He was born in 1928, died in 2005. And taking that information, um, I can kind of figure out where she was on an earlier census from 1950. So I saw her, I found her husband, and then there is her son with her. Um, so it's great because even from that little bit of information gleaned from the tablet, you're able then to take that and populate it into other search engines and come up with a more robust um, history for any given individual. Another way to search is by maps on the map tab on the website. If you go to that, and right now we have St. Louis 1 and 2. Those are the only cemeteries currently incorporated into the database. If you look below this, you could see map collection images. And those are some maps of the two cemeteries dating to the 1930s, 1937. Um, St. Louis 1 and St. Louis 2 were both mapped. Those are the maps that the Archdiocese uses. Um, so they're available here as well. But you can also look at the interactive Google Maps. So right up here under interactive Google Maps, there's two choices. If I go to St. Louis Cemetery number one, it looks like this. There's tons and tons and tons of little dots. If you zoom in, you can see that each dot is on top of a tomb or an owned plot within the cemetery. And then if you click on one roof, um, the HNOC tomb number will come up. It'll give a little bit of a description. So this says um, it's owned by the LaBranche family. It's a totally enclosed by an iron fence. It has a top and bottom closure tablet and then a link. So if you follow that link, it'll bring you to that tomb's landing page on the database. So it tells us, of course, we're in St. Louis 1. It tells us the tomb number, which is 58. It's a freestanding tomb. It gives the Archdiocesan tomb number, what's inscribed on the pediment, the description. So it's totally enclosed um, language of inscription. So all the tablets are inscribed in French, the material or condition. So it's marble, it's weathered, and the tablets themselves are bowed. And then the tablet shows a cross with a wreath inscribed as well. There's two people memorialized in this tomb, Julia and Arthur. Um, and then it gives the original survey card and a photograph of the tomb. So it's a nice way to work backwards. So if you're in the cemetery itself and you're standing in front of a tomb, but you want to learn a little bit more about it and you want to see what it looked like in 1981, you're able to click on it and then go back. This has been instrumental in helping to do conservation work in St. Louis 1 and 2 because we are able to go back and reference those photos taken decades earlier where the tomb most often was in much better condition. So we're able to decide, okay, we don't know what the current tomb profile looks like, but if we look at the survey pictures from 1980s, like we can see it and then we could recreate it today. Or the cemetery tomb does not currently have a tablet, it's been lost or it's broken. 
and the interment books do not tell us exactly who's interred within the tomb. So we're able to look at those photographs and then end the survey cards and have a better understanding of who's within any given tomb and the history of how it how it looked to aid in conservation measures. So this is um, my information. I'm gonna quickly just show you the website as well, um, but I'll leave this up for one second if you wanna grab this information or you could just pause. Um, so let's go to the website itself because I'm gonna show you a tiny bit of extra stuff um, that I think will be helpful to you. So this is the website. We just saw the interactive maps. I also wanna take you to the additional resources tab because it's extremely helpful. It's kind of a catch all for all cemetery based um, resources in the city of New Orleans. So there's digital resources lift, listed. There are also the Dead Space Report, not Dead Space itself from the University of Pennsylvania. A bibliography produced from Dead Space, Find a Grave, which I'm sure many of you are already very familiar with. Um, Greenwood Cemetery has a search function on their website. New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries also provide a host of information on their website. And then Lafayette Cemetery number one has a survey up as well done by Fred and Heath Hatfield. Um, that survey is really helpful and useful, especially as we're waiting for Lafayette number one's 1980 survey information to be launched on the website. This is a great resource. There's also tons of archival resources in town. Some are housed at the Historic New Orleans Collection. Some are housed at the State Museum. Some are housed at the City Archives at the Public Library. So take a look at this. A lot of you have used the Louisiana Historical, Cent Historical Center's WPA Tombstone Index. That information's all digitized on Family Search as well. An important thing to note from that, those survey cards, when you look at them, some of them say on the bottom SUP, which means it was supplied. So that's not information that they're seeing on the tablets themselves. That's information that they're gleaning from the internment books or the cemetery records. So a lot of times people come to me or others and they say, oh, I know the tablet exists in the cemetery because I saw it in the WPA tombstone index. My first question always is like, does it say SUP? at the bottom, because if it does, that most likely was not taken from the cemetery landscape itself. It was taken from the interment books. So the, the headstone or the tablet most likely does not exist because they did not take that information from the field. Mm -hmm. There's also print resources. So that's a great um, page as well. And then contact us. This was what I was saying. If you come across errors, this is a, we're always updating it and trying to make it as best as it can be. So if you find an error, please email reference at hnoc.org with any comments or questions, um, or if you just have questions in general about the website or the database or the project, you can get in touch with them through that email address. I'm gonna just do one more quick search. I'll do Landry again but I wanna show you a tomb. So let's see, view more on this person. J-O is their given name, initials, death date, October 1st, 1889. They were not in the military, it's not listed, and they were a male, so let's take a look. This is St. Louis Cemetery number two, square one, tomb number 140. It's an English language transcription. There are a lot of individuals interred within this tomb. Many, many. Um, so on here, it has a photograph of the tomb. Again, we see all that transcription information. You can also zoom in to see it a little bit better, which is helpful. This one, because there's so many names, it has multiple cards. So you have to click through them. But so it starts off 
at the top. It gives information about the first closure tablet and it works its way down. So all of these survey cards are for this one tomb. So it's important to click all the way through. See everything. The other nice thing about this one, it has the UPenn condition survey from 2012. So if I go ahead and expand on that, say, is it a ruin? Ruin? No. Is it a demolished remnant? No. Um, it has stucco, lime, or concrete stucco on it. It's not been re resurfaced. It has two sub vaults. And then it has a rating. So an overall tomb integrity rating, condition of tomb body, and a condition of tomb roof. If you want to learn a little bit more about what that means, you could hover over it to see. But this is also helpful because it gives condition at this point in time. So 2012, we have a, a written information about the condition. And then from 1981, we see the tomb itself. And we're able to look at it to see the condition um, from that survey. So both ways are helpful. And again, if you want to learn, if you want to go on any other person's landing page that's interred in this tomb, you can click on their name. Alexander Kennedy, click on view tomb, and then it brings you back to the tomb where everyone's interred. Um, and then quickly about the cemeteries, there's a few paragraphs on each of the two cemeteries currently on the database and about the project, which is more extended version than what I shared about the project starting in the 1980s and then continuing to the present day. Like I said, we're currently working on um, transcribing the information for St. Joseph Cemetery number one. We're about Next year, we'll start with St. Joseph Cemetery number two, and then hopefully get those two launched after we clean up the data. So those will be the next two available through the database. Um, but it is an ongoing project. We hope that this will be a repository of surveys moving forward. So any contemporary surveys or future surveys will also ultimately be incorporated into the site and made available to the public. Um, I hope you all take advantage and use it. I use it very, very often. Actually, the Archdiocese, because it has St. Louis 1 and 2, they use it. So if you call them looking for a tomb, one of the first places they look is through this database, just because it's a really quick and easy way to access the information. And then they'll go in their internal records. But um, again, my information was on that last slide of the PowerPoint. I'm always happy to help answer any questions or give advice about where to look for specific cemetery records. I also want to mention before I close things, um, back in 2020, we did a six part um, webinar on researching your Catholic ancestors. A lot of those, there were six one hour segments. So it's six hours of um, advice on research topics. Some are newspaper based, some are archival based, um, but quite a few were cemetery about cemeteries specifically. So take a look at those. They're available through the City Archives website. They're also available through the website of New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. So thank you all very much.